You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome, I'm Esther Awuni. Many thanks for joining us. On the show today, we'll discuss the impact of digital transformation on Africa's development. As always, you can join the conversation with the hashtag Beyond Markets. And you can follow my Twitter handle too, at Esther Budaga. Now, how should African countries position for the continent's digital future? Amrote Abdella, the Regional Director of Microsoft for Africa, joins me as we delve into the likely impact of digital transformation on economies in Africa. Amrote, thank you so much. Pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you. So that is a narrative now. I mean, there's, we, Africa's narrative now is now closely tied to digital transformation, ICT. It's now become such an integral part because we're seeing new opportunities that are connecting people to opportunities. We're seeing a new uh, ecosystem of innovation across different sectors. And so the verdict is, if Africa is to progress and have a good future, shared prosperity, inclusive growth, ICT, digital transformation, it's an, it's an integral part and we have to tow that path. You've worked with a number of businesses, startups, and you've seen how this uh, digital transformation is, uh, or the potential it has to transform businesses uh, going into the future. What has been your experience? Look, I think the experience is, has been actually very varied. Um, but, but what is true and what has stayed on course over the last few years across Africa is that innovation is actually happening at a faster pace than, than, than we've ever seen. And so I think the challenge for us now is how do we actually integrate some of these disruptions that are coming around uh, into mainstreaming it into our business practices, our industry verticals? Uh, how do we think about government evolution around sort of some of the e-services that need to come on board and, and the ease of doing business? So innovation very much sort of especially built in Africa by Africans is something that we're seeing more and more and and our responsibility as Microsoft for Africa specifically has been on how do we actually enable Africans how do we train ourselves to be able to utilize but also take advantage about on the technological sort of disruptions that are coming up and about and so out of Nigeria out of Kenya out of South Africa Egypt Morocco we're seeing a number of solutions that are that are being developed by young entrepreneurs uh, using sort of up-to-date technologies uh, mm -hmm. to be able to disrupt their local markets. But you know, let, let's, let's go back to the basics. Before we even get to that stage, there's the issue of, I mean, broadband penetration in the first right. place. I mean, from a policy perspective, we need the government, the policymakers, to first of all lay that foundation. And I know that it differs from country to country. Some of the smaller, poorer countries have a bigger issue with that, especially, you know, getting it to the rural areas, yeah. the grassroots, where we have more of the uh, no, African population. Yeah. But for the bigger, medium-sized country who are already you know, gaining traction, how much, to what extent would you say, uh, how far would you say we still need to go or how much ground do we still need to cover to get policymakers to really understand the importance of, you know, sp of laying down that groundwork of ensuring that we have this adequate broadband penetration? Look, absolutely. So broadband and, and connectivity is, is something that we have to tackle. Um, today we have about 42% of our populations to some extent that are online, right, uh, mobile or other. Uh, but everyone, I think, is actively looking at the space. Ourselves, as Microsoft, we have our airband connectivity initiative, uh, very much looking at spreading but also investing heavily uh, around connectivity with the aim of bringing about 4.2 billion people online, right? And, and so ourselves, others who are investing on connectivity, I think very much are laying the foundations for what needs to be done. But I do believe today that we cannot and should not solely depend and wait for the infrastructure to be in place for us to be able to advance the, the innovation, the disruption, and the new business models that are coming up and about. And so as that's happening, right, uh, investment by the private sector as well as government to lay down broadband, to lay down connectivity and make it more affordable, uh, there's an element of also what are the services that will actually drive usage, right? What are the solutions that are relevant to be able to uh, be used by consumers and businesses alike? I know that you work with you, um, spearhead Microsoft's investments across 54 African Correct. countries, and you're working very hard with your team. Tell us those, specifically those opportunities that you're helping to identify and how your team is you know, harnessing those opportunities. Yeah, so under uh, Microsoft for Africa, it's been five years now since we've launched the initiative. It uh, was launched in February 2013, with the aim of really driving three things. One is innovation, which is how do we actually bring African innovation to the forefront? How do we enable it? How do we give it a platform uh, for our local innovations to actually gain market share but also mind share around the, pot the potential of Africa. The second one is around skills, which is how do we develop future proof ready work skills coming out of
out of Africa, right? Which is how do we compete in a world where there's conversations around AI, right? Machine learning. Uh, there's a conversation around sort of fourth industrial revolution that's happening now. What does that mean in Africa as we get ready, right? And so there's estimation that within the next 10 to 15 years that we in Africa will be impacted around that, right? Or even sooner, depending on the industries that we're talking about. So how do we make sure that we are building our skills, our youth, uh, our existing workforce to be able to compete, but also uh, drive relevance and, and, and compete in, in, the, in those markets? The third piece uh, after innovation, skills, is around connectivity um, and at the heart of what you're talking about. Because with, uh, with the last five years, we have driven about 15 uh, pilots uh, using our TV white spaces technologies across six countries, right? And varying from rural to urban. Uh, and so you look at the potential that, that those solutions have. We started in Kenya with our Mawingu project. To date, we've expanded from 15 hotspots to 650 uh, with around 11,000 users. And, and those are very much looking at connecting small, medium uh, enterprises. So you have small shops with okay. connectivity, driving usage, consumption, but also sort of connecting markets, which I think is very much at the core of it. So when we're talking about connectivity, it's it's true that you know it's, it's at the forefront and we need to tackle it. But it's also, what do we do after you give connectivity? What are the skills that, that the youth will drive? What are the businesses leverage uh, that they will come for? Absolutely. So I'm just thinking, because I mean, when we talk about African youth, we know that they are the, they are the heart of this. Yes. At the heart of this also is the aim to get, you know, to drive inclusive growth, economic yes. growth, because this is all geared towards, you know, bettering the uh, the African economy, the African economy on the continent. But I'm thinking, but when I see the unemployment numbers, the youth unemployment numbers, and I wonder to myself, it's so high. Yes. And on the one hand, but on the other hand, we have this bunch of youth who are doing amazing things, you know, from an innovation point of view. And I'm asking, I'm wondering, are we bringing everyone together? Are we? How do we? reconcile those numbers where we have youths who are, you know, have these great ideas and are doing great things and I have, and I have support from the likes of Microsoft yes. and those who perhaps have that idea but don't have the opportunities, that bridge that could you know, connect them to the other side to show them that, okay, there's a lot of innovation going on and they don't have to be jobless and there's stuff that they can do. Absolutely. But look, I think there's also, if, if we take a step backwards and, and just look at what needs to be done, one is making sure that our youth have the right skills to go into the job market, right? That, that's the first one. Because most of the complaints that you get from industry leaders today is that I can't find the right, the right skill set that I can actually match to the job needs that I have, right? So one is addressing that. But the second piece is around innovation, the entrepreneurial uh, element that you touched on. And, and for us to be able to address it, there are a few things. One is to make sure that we give the right ecosystem, right? So that if you are a young girl or a young guy out of any of our markets, uh, anywhere in Africa, that you have the opportunity to come and actually test your ideas, right? Okay. But the second step to that is to make sure that your idea goes from becoming a startup to a small medium enterprise, to then becoming a multinational. Because that's the true element of being able to address and harness the innovation that's coming, but also creating employment, right? So it's not innovation for the sake of innovation, but it's, okay. uh, it's our ability to invest and create jobs in the process. Um, and so I think it can't just be driven by, by private sector for sure. It's uh, definitely a co-investment and a partnership with government for us to be able to address this systematically, but also sustainably as okay. well. So still on this subject, what are those, sp I mean, your experience, those yeah. specific skills that are required in this you know, age for, you know, for want to be for those who want to be part of the digital age, especially the youth. I mean, we've talked about you talked yeah. about AI, yeah. and I mean, I, I hear stories and I watch documentaries about how AI, you know, could drastically change the future of work. And I'm wondering to myself, wow, are we ready here in Africa? Look, I think we, um, I, we we will have to be ready, right? It's not a question of, of uh, will we, it's it's how do we get we ready and when will we get ready to eventually get to that stage, right? But as that's happening, I think there are some critical skills that we today need, right? And so from our side, part of, there are a couple of programs that we run. One is our internship program, very much looking at how do we actually identify and place interns in our partners uh, so that they have the real hands-on job experience. Uh, and so to date, we have placed over 300 interns uh, with partners and so those skills are very much focused around technical marketing and also uh, business uh, acumen, right? So how do they get a sense of what does it require to be a, a computer science major, but in job practicalities, um, and, and what does that entail? So there's that element of sort of giving the hands-on training. But I think the other piece to it is, which is how do we actually identify, is the ability to be 
analytical, right? The soft skills that are needed for us to be able to navigate problems. And so problem solving, it would be, I'm in, in our view, sort of, you know, in addition to your, you know, technical competencies, business, it's your ability to solve day-to-day -day challenges. And so that flexibility, that fluidity that comes with being an, an analytical thinker, uh, right, is I think one advantage that any person going into a job has today, right? And so, you know, we talk about AI and what does that come and what will that replace? There's an element of empathy that that, that will never be replaced, right? So the soft skills of, of our ability to be able to address that, I think, is, is key. You know, for the AI, some, uh, some people jokingly say, I mean, somebody's got to program the robot in the first place, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> well, let's, let, let's, let's talk about, uh, I mean, you have a, a background in venture capital. Yeah. Let's talk about, I mean, on this show, we'll talk a lot about uh, entrepreneurs with great ideas yes. and their ability to attract investors, to attract, you know, uh, private equity and just get that funding to take them yes. to from point A to, you know, to point B. And, you know, go global, you know, even, I mean, obviously there's potential for that. In your experience, uh, what are, how would you describe the quality of ideas that you see, the quality of innovation that you see among the youth, those small businesses that you've worked with? Look, I think it's evolved quite a bit. Um, when we started in, with the For Africa initiative in 2013, there was very much um, an early sort of celebration of ideas. Uh, uh, very much, you know, someone has a great idea, sounds good, and so there's quite a lot of money that goes into it um, and a lot of support. But years down the road, you realize that some of these ideas never really matured, right? And so there's, a, I think, a, a, a knowledge, but I think also a sense of urgency now to really identify the businesses that have, uh, the, from our side at least, the technical savviness, the business readiness to be able to compete. And so um, it's beyond sort of, you know, the compreneurs who go around and, okay. and, and, and getting funding, but it's the ability to now grow some of these businesses so that in five years down the road, they're actually businesses with employees and, and growing, okay. uh, ideally beyond a country into the region and, and uh, globally as so well. So now it's not even about having that great idea. No. That idea needs to survive down the line as we continue our discussion on the impact of digital transformation on Africa's development. Still with me is Amrote Abdella, Regional Director, Microsoft for Africa. Amrote, thank you so much for your time so thank far. I, let's, I wanted to focus on small businesses because, I mean, they're big, they, well, they have always been the backbone of yes. uh, African, the African economic growth. But let's talk about how they can use cloud, the opportunity that cloud services provide to, to build smarter uh, businesses that, can, that they can actually scale, bring to scale. Absolutely. The, look, the small medium enterprise market in, in Africa today is, I, we believe, is still one of the biggest markets uh, and opportunities that we have, right? Uh, to grow, to invest in, but also to, to digitally transform. Um, and so with that initiative, we've, uh, we've invested in our BIS for Africa portal, which is a platform that we've created to bring small medium enterprises online, bring their business online, and create a marketplace where they can exchange services as well. Um, so with that, there's the inherent belief that cloud computing today um, is still the best way for, for small medium businesses to grow their businesses effectively in a secure way where they're able to essentially create platforms, uh, bring their businesses online, and also transact in a more efficient, affordable way. Um, there's a one company out of uh, Nigeria, EcoVault, uh, that has been partnering with Microsoft specifically around connectivity. And EcoVault solution is looking at how do they bring SMEs online. And so this is about web creation, it's about uh, cloud computing, it's around affordability, security, but essentially allowing a small uh, business uh, to be able to operate remotely, right? So it's that level of flexibility and agility that, that comes with it, but uh, using cloud technology in a, in a way that is relevant, that that is useful, but also that allows small and medium enterprises to use services that big corporations can use uh, at a rate that allows them to grow their businesses as well. Now, I know that it's not just about businesses. I mean, when yeah. we talk about digital transformation yes. for economic growth, yeah. I mean, we're talking about how it can impact on us delivering better healthcare services, yes. the education sector, and agriculture, you know, those things that touch the heart of, of the, the average African, especially those in rural areas or those yeah. who need to come into the prosperity net. Right. I, mean, well, I mean, like I said, it's at the heart of all of this is, you know, prosperity and yeah. just a better life, as it were, for the average African. So speak to that fact in terms of how we're deploying in innovative ways in the healthcare sectors across the continent, 
healthcare sector, educate, let's start with the healthcare sector. Absolutely. So look, around health, um, there is, uh, so I'll, let me start off with the discussion that we had earlier around connectivity. Okay. Using TV white spaces in Botswana, uh, we have been able to connect uh, in rural Botswana, three hospitals, five auxiliary clinics, uh, essentially making uh, diagnosis testing uh, available to over 3,000 patients, right? And so it's the ability to really think around the, how do we make services remotely more available, predictable, but also in a way that provides access, right? And, and improvement of uh, services. Uh, there's a company out of Kenya that we've worked with very closely called Access Mobile. Access Mobile today allows you to make book, uh, to get reminders about your appointments. So there's an element of how do we also ensure that there is usability, but also relevance of, of, um, of technology technology in the true delivery of healthcare services to patients, right? So it's a better patient access, it's a better record management, it's a better predictability, but it's also it's a preventive measure for us to also at a regional, at a country level, to also be able to drive uh, using technology. And so some of these uh, solutions, including uh, Access Mobile, are things that you can easily access on your mobile phone, right? And so the text SMS allows you to um, use it and access it and also just penetrate and, and, and disseminate information to people who are in the most unconnected and rural areas as well. So it's those type of solutions that allows us today to, to think of, you know, how do we continue to transform uh, the notion around healthcare delivery services in Africa but, in the but, way that makes sense for us. But would you say that there is adequate buy-in in this instance, adequate buy-in from or by the government, because we talk about yeah. um, the, the lack or the the way the I'll use Nigeria as an example. Our primary healthcare, mm. I mean, system, it's it's completely broken, and there's so many. I mean, we talk about maternal uh, maternal mortality. Yeah. We talk about maternal health. Uh, one in five kid ch children die before the age of five, and you wonder. Yeah. I mean, these services, this kind of innovation, can help if a pregnant mother needs Correct. to get to the hospital. She's in distress, and you know, doctor is miles away. If she has that kind of access, that kind of mobile, you know, access, I'm yeah. thinking that could go a long way. So I'm so I'm wondering, who should obviously the government should drive this, yeah. but I'm thinking the collaboration at that level. Why is it? still the way it is. How can we well, just look, turn that around? There's definitely a sort of point around how do we make this more available? But also, how do we showcase? Because look, there's a lot of testing that's happening at this stage, and and and, and we also have to be cognizant of sort of where some of these solutions and delivery systems are, right? So we're very much at at the takeoff stage. But the wider adoption definitely has to happen for us to transform our healthcare uh, services. You talk about maternal uh, mortality and, and and the impact of it. Uh, not in Nigeria, but uh, close by in Cameroon, there's a solution called uh, Gift uh, Gifted Mom. And what they do essentially is very much focused on how do they allow for uh, antenatal care to be provided to mothers in advance, right? So again, SMS, but also uh, allowing for services to be delivered in an affordable way, right? And, and the impact of it and the turnout has led to an 80% increase of access in some of the rural areas. Uh, very across remote, because the Correct. issue what this we hear is, is, is these areas are so remote. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, so there's definitely a piece around that. But now, specifically around healthcare, why, why it's even even more important um, to think about cloud technology in the healthcare facility and, and, and the healthcare industry in general is around security and privacy, right, which is very much at the core of it. And, and we at Microsoft are very much looking at how do we allow, one, in terms of educating, but also around policy to inform and make sure that we are providing the right platforms for uh, healthcare professionals, but also for policymakers to take that step in that, in that area, particularly because it also affects us uh, literally in, in our health and our day-to-day uh, -day well-being as well. You know, it is because it's instances like that that I think about and I remember sometimes yeah. And I, and I ask myself, yeah. you know, sometimes they say a rising ship lifts, a rising tide lifts all ships, but it, that is not exactly happening on the continent. It's, uh, we have growth here, we have this happening here, but it's not like widespread. And I'm fearing that some countries might be left, could be left behind if this is not, you know, we're not going at a pace or at a level that, you know, carries all the entire continent. So we're talking about Africa. We're not exactly talking about the entire continent because there's some, so many spots that have been left on, on untouched as it were. Yeah. <laughs> there, 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 are, there are definitely areas where we are seeing a faster adoption, right? Uh, but I am very optimistic that in fact that, you know, with the, the, the showcasing of success, mm -hmm. of the impact, right? Uh, uh, we look at the SDGs, right? And the impact and the aspirations that were around that. Um, and so there's definitely sort of a, a see, learn, test and learn faster to be able to implement that I uh, believe will happen as we uh, move forward. 
for, for education, yeah. I, I think, I, I mean, I get a sense that a lot more is happening uh, in the education sector where we're seeing uh, students being more innovative. I mean, all these all this apps, all this uh, innovation, helping them to learn better and you know, just giving them uh, the world, making the world a more global village for them. I mean, you're here in yeah. Nigeria, you have access to the information as someone in, has an, an American university. So I'm thinking that is, even, so speak to that point, the fact that it's probably a lot better in the education space, I mean, thank God. As, no, absolutely. Look, and, and today the average student, uh, and if I dare say, uh, is, is more informed than you and I were probably when we were going to school, right? So so how do you sort of then take this technology, this access, this awareness of what's available globally uh, in a way that it makes sense for them to learn? But also, again, it goes back to the discussion around skills, right? So it's beyond education, it's beyond access. It's the what skills are they coming out with uh, as they're graduating high schools, universities, uh, and and postgraduate degrees that is relevant and that, that can actually be applied in uh, the real world, uh, mm -hmm. so to say, so that they're competitive, but also secure employment. Um, and I go back to our internship program because I really believe that there's an element around how do you give practical experience, right? The hands-on experience that helps shape, but also fine tune. We've started it, but I think there's an even bigger demand and opportunity for everyone else to join across industries to be able to say, how do you actually foster taking more early adopters and, and early, uh, early on young graduates to be able to have the hands-on training. To date, the impact of that, what we've seen is that there's an 85% employment rate post-internships, uh, right? So, so how do we foster that more and more, right? It's giving them exposure, visibility, but also how do you, you as an industry leader, get a chance to say, look, these are the skill sets that I need and this is how I'll train for it so that I can you know, service my own needs um, and in terms of the industry, but also have a wider impact as well. Speaking about industries at, at, at a higher level, yeah. intra-African trade, I know that so many industries in Africa could do, yeah. could use with, you know, the right kind of technology and innovation that can help them, you know, scale and well, not even outside of the continent, within the continent. Yeah. I mean, intra-African trade numbers are so poor, I hear between 12 and 15 percent. And I'm wondering, with this kind of innovation that we, uh, technology that we have at our disposal, there's so many, it could literally explode, but what is, what is holding us back? Look, there's, there are a number of things, right, in terms of um, what is holding us back. Um, I think one is around the intra-trade, yes, compared to Europe, 60%, absolutely, we have a long way to go. But I do believe that we're actually taking the right steps, right? So you look at uh, in-country first. And in-country, uh, you look at the doing business ranking. Uh, Nigeria itself has improved 28 points in the last year, right, uh, with uh, some of the top 10 uh, reforms having happened in some of the, the countries that we have whether it's Malawi, Zambia, or Nigeria. Uh, so those numbers give, give us sort of, you know, the, 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 the pointer that we are moving in the right direction. Uh, but as we expand it more, absolutely, we have an opportunity to do that more. And what's happening with digital transformation is today a business that is uh, in any of the markets uh, can actually create and drive their business uh, through digital platforms, right? So the boom of e-commerce in, uh, in Nigeria has, has been one of the success stories that we have seen. But definitely, I think with more in-country reforms, the ease of doing business, uh, the starting of business processes that is being facilitated. And if you look at sort of the where we've started, um, it, it used to take 60 days uh, to start a business uh, in 2003 to today where we have 22 days on average to start a business across Africa. So, so those things are definitely starting. And, and that mushrooming, I think, will definitely pave the way for us to do it. But are we doing it fast enough? Probably not. And, and we should I mean, definitely double they, they, down. There yeah. should be more traction. But yeah. Because I know there's some models uh, that are used by countries, some are tailor-made, some yes. are copied from other countries. Do you think that we should see at that level more collaboration where we see, okay, some like Kenya's M-Pesa, for instance, we saw it, in it, I mean, it was just phenomenal. It worked for Kenya. But so that, that as an example, do we, do you, should we see more collaboration with maybe between the private sector among countries or governments to say, okay, this works in your country. Can we copy it? Can we Absolutely. emulate and see how it works for us? Absolutely. But I think what with that is, is look, the, the MPESA model has been referred to many times, right? And, and, and it's not for lack of effort that it hasn't gone into other markets. Mm -hmm. But there's an element of what is it locally that has allowed for MPESA to mushroom the way it has, right? For it to have the market share that it does in, in Kenya. 
So I think, yes, definitely taking the concept of, of what it facilitates, the service itself, is the right thing in terms of what notions we should copy. But the products itself to now come into any of the, the markets may or may not work, right? And there have been efforts even in Nigeria to be able to copy similar solutions. But, but what it delivers in terms of service um, is, I think, what has allowed the success of Mpesa to become what it is. Okay. And, and similarly to that, we should probably look at what is it that we can do locally to drive those, uh, those types of innovations. Amarote, thank you so much for your time today. Pleasure, Pleasure. having you on the show today. Thank I've you. been speaking to Amarote Abdella, Regional Director, Microsoft for Africa.